and a very warm welcome to Bharata First. You're watching Big Picture with me, Frank Rausen Pereira. Since you're here, I would like to thank you for your continued support. For those of you who haven't already subscribed, please like the video, subscribe, hit the bell icon, and then all notifications. Do follow our social media handles for all the latest updates, and you can also subscribe to our newsletter to get some incisive content. The Bharata First team runs a daily Big Picture quiz. Please do participate by going through the description in the Big Picture videos. Here are the UPI IDs for those of you who would like to come forward and contribute. A small contribution you make will be a giant leap for us to keep bringing you this content. So do continue to show your love and support. All the information is in the description of this video. So please go through it. Now, on to the discussion. KP Sharma Oli was sworn in as Nepal's Prime Minister for the third time on Friday, days after he lost a vote of uh, confidence in Parliament. President Vidya Devi Bhandari administered the oath of office and secrecy to Oli at a ceremony at Sheetal Nivas after he was reappointed to the post on Thursday night as the opposition parties failed to secure majority seats in parliament to form a new government. Oli, the chairman of the CPN UML, lost a crucial trust vote in the House of Representatives on Monday. Oli will now have to take a vote of confidence at the House within 30 days failing which an attempt to form a government under Article 76.5 of the Constitution would be initiated. He previously served as Prime Minister from October 11, 2015 to August 3, 2016 and again from February 15, 2018 to May 13, 2021. In this edition of Big Picture, we will analyze the political developments in Nepal. Joining me on the program today are Manjeev Puri, former ambassador of India to Nepal, Swaran Singh, School of International Politics, JNU, and uh, Pramit Pal Chaudhary, foreign editor of the Hindustan Times. Thank you to all my guests for joining me on this edition of Big Picture. Ambassador, let me start the program with you first. Uh, let's talk about the latest developments. That, of course, is uh, KP Oli has been sworn in yet again as prime minister after all those political developments that have taken place. Here we are yet again with uh, the same Prime Minister take, being sworn in once more. Your thoughts on everything that has happened? Frank, you have to judge Nepal by Nepal standards. You know, a few months back, we were all lauding the Supreme Court of Nepal for uh, having upheld best constitutional practices, reinstated the house which Mr. Oli wanted to dissolve. And look, we've gone through the entire circle. So what does it seem? It seems that the other side doesn't have the numbers. How he's managed to cobble it together? Well, that's Nepali politics for you. In Nepal, let me tell you, no one can be kept out. No one should be kept out. No one is untouchable, if I may use a word like that. All kinds of things are possible. The politicians there are not even shut down by COVID. And life goes on. So you have Mr. Oli back. Will he be able to get the majority on uh, within 30 days? I don't know the answer. It would appear possible, but we don't know. In any case, if that doesn't happen, he will remain interim prime minister when the country goes through a longish period for elections. Possibly that's exactly what he wanted in December. That's Nepal for you. Please take it the way it comes, one step at a time. We should uh, not judge it by our standards, but by any other standards anywhere else in the world. But this is democracy, a very vibrant, let me say, anarchic, chaotic, and willing to do deals democracy in action. So, Pramit, let me bring you in now and let's talk about what does this mean really for the neighbors, mainly mm -hmm. China and India. Where does it leave both India and China? Well, well, as you know, we've had we've had our problems. India has had its problems with Prime Minister Oli. Um, he one of the key sources of his his popularity was the fact that he he effectively concocted a a border dispute with India um, and uh, then pretended to stand up to us on this issue. Um, but it's also true that he's popular and in, in, because he's carried out a number of popular policies regarding the Terai region, the popular people in the Terai area, um, uh, relatively unusual for a Pahari leader like himself. Um, but he's also cultivated the Chinese uh, quite openly, um, especially the, the, there's been a lot of um, uh, the Chinese ambassador uh, has been a regular uh, a regular supporter of his. Um, and partly part of his game to play against India and arouse a certain type of Nepalese nationalism um, that allows him to try to bind together a, a coalition 
uh, in the Nepalese parliament and develop popular support. It has been partly successful, as I've said. Though in this case, I would argue his political fortunes are really helped by the fact that he carried out these ter uh, uh, welfare policies for the Terai, people in the Terai, which resulted in the uh, Janata Samajwadi party, a Terai party, deciding unusually to support him uh, in, in uh, building another coalition uh, and ensuring that he, the opposition was unable to get a majority and therefore giving him a second lease of life. Having said that, my sense is that Oli will be a weaker individual in his next round as a prime minister. Um, he's had to cobble together a coalition in which he's had to agree to uh, form an agreement with one of the rebel leaders in his own party, um, uh, Madame Nepal, because who had walked out earliest uh, voted against him. Uh, he's also had to work out a deal with the Samajwadi Party, which is a party, and uh, Ambassador Puri would know better than I would, that is not, uh, that is actually relatively close to India. Um, it's a party that's the Terai, the Samar, uh, the uh, Madesi groups down there are, are tend to be quite supportive of India. So my sense is that the new coalition that Oli will depend on will be one that will not be particularly uh, interested in the anti-Indian, anti pro-Chinese uh, deliberate attempts to build up a sort of uh, fake confrontation on that front uh, than, uh, uh, than the previous coalition that he that Oli depended on. So that would be my sense. Uh, and we'll see again how long Oli will survive. It's a relatively weak coalition. And his biggest problem remains the fact that his battles with Prachanda, his failure to fulfill his promise to step down and hand over power to Prachanda's coalition within his own party uh, has been the primary reason for his earlier demise and has been a major source of unpopularity among Nepalese who recognize what Oli uh, uh, did in this sense. And that has not been resolved in any way. And if anything, I think the divisions within his own party uh, will be, at least with it, between him and Prachanda, will be, if anything, stronger and worse in the coming in the coming months. Right. Professor, let me bring you in. And this is a point that I wanted to raise and take forward with you as well, this issue of Prachanda. Where does this leave Prachanda? And uh, what are the equations going to be like going forward now between Prachanda and K.P. Sharma Oli? I think since 2018, when the two came together, uh, we have seen that uh, Prachanda has been gradually on the losing side. And we have seen that uh, despite understandings of the swiping Prime Ministership, uh, Prime Minister Oli has continued and survived so far. So in that sense, uh, the fact that he has been able to stay in office itself uh, is a vantage point for uh, KP uh, Sharma Oli in this case. And anyone who has a position of power can then use various processes and structures to further strengthen his position. So what we know now is that uh, Minister Oli has a support of uh, 121 members of parliament. And the next largest, largest grouping is the main opposition party, which is uh, Nepalese Congress, uh, has uh, less than half of that, about 61 members of parliament. And if you look at how infested the, the politics in Nepal has become uh, with factionalism and the number of former prime ministers and aspirant prime ministers that are today, you know, sort of crisscrossing these, uh, you know, closed door uh, meetings for various uh, sort of uh, uh, permutations, combinations, uh, it would continue to be advantage uh, uh, KP Sharma only because uh, worst case scenario, which I don't think is uh, necessarily going to happen because with about 32 you know, members of JSP, uh, of which 16 possibly could be sort of, uh, you know, sort of uh, supporting potentially because as the report says, they were kept in a luxury hotel uh, out of fear that they could uh, join that anti only uh, uh, kind of government. So that means somebody has hold on these 16 members of parliament as per reports. Madhav Nepal has another 28, as he claims. Uh, so there are also reports that uh, between uh, Bauram Hattarai, Madhav Nepal, and Oli, there have been some kind of communications of understanding. So we might see in 30 days some kind of uh, very, very uh, sort of disjointed and as uh, uh, we just said, weak 
uh, government. But worst case scenario, as I was saying, in case he loses and is not able to prove his majority in 30 days, uh, he would stay as caretaker government. And it's very interesting if you read the constitution of 2015, uh, Prime Minister has enormous amount of authority because even the dissolution of parliament in worst case scenario would happen on the advice of Prime Minister. Uh, so in that case, you know, the one could choose dates and other things as to when to announce elections, how long to have elections, how to organize those elections. Uh, the last announcement of uh, 20th December was to have elections in uh, April and 10th of May would have finished the elections. So his caretaker government in that case could have kind of come to an end soon. Now he's got an additional lease of life in that sense as Prime Minister to continue to try these combinations and even in worst case stay as Prime Minister for a little longer period of time. So from 2018, this becomes one of the longest serving Prime Minister in that sense, which gives him both sort of certain aura in terms of uh, influencing public opinion and sort of also influencing the way uh, sort of structures and processes work in uh, staying in power in various democracies. Last point, I think this is a reflection of how weak democracies and fragile democracies not only constantly have these kind of difficulties, but also become open to external influences. And in that sense, as you mentioned, the neighboring countries, particularly China and India, would constantly be, will be keeping watch as to who is trying to, who is trying to influence the trends in what fashion. K.P. Sharma only is clearly known to be pro-Beijing. Lately, he's been not ratcheting up with India, but in that sense, it's a clear uh, example of O.P. Sharma being pro-China Prime Minister. So in that sense, his continuation would have some implications for how India views situation in Nepal and how far it can still influence things as, as they proceed in coming weeks there. Uh, but it's, uh, it's, a, it's not a happy situation that external countries will have to keep vigilant, keep trying to you know, see how they can influence internal situation. Also very, very bad for the domestic population there, which is facing pandemic numbers are going up and such kind of, you know, sort of a constant jostling means that no serious decision making is happening on the ground. Politicians are busy doing, you know, these other things of staying in power. So I think it's not a good right. happy situation, but it it would mean that maybe Prime Minister Oli could stay in power longer than most people are anticipating, which is caretaker Prime Minister's limited time until elections. So Ambassador, let's take this particular point forward then, you know, and what this means for India. You know, uh, both Pramit and uh, Swaran Singh have spoken about that. So since you've, you've been in Nepal, you served there as the last ambassador of India. So take us through, uh, you know, uh, what this means for us and uh, should we be worried about the developments there? Look, uh, if there is stability in Nepal, it's invariably good and should be good for India. Mr. Oli has come to power, and I think Pramit made this point, that in a sense, he is contingent on a one part of the uh, Samajwadi party there, the Janata Samajwadi party. Actually, this these two parties, the one led by Upendra Yadav and Baburam Bhattarai, and the other led by Maya, Mahan Thakur and uh, Rajendra Mato, technically haven't merged. So, you know, this is one group which can go about doing this split vote business. Now, the uh, Communist Party, the UML itself, has about 121 uh, MPs there. If you add 16 of them, you kind of cross the halfway mark. The thing in Nepal is, once you cross the halfway mark, you can play the games. Now, will he be weak? Your Prime Minister, the question of being weak doesn't arise. Will he want to take on India? I don't think in the near term, because of the support that he necessarily needs from a party which comes from the Terai and which does think that India is an important player for themselves and for what is happening. However, remember that when it comes to elections and elections could be around the corner, they could last a year or so, we don't know all that. Mr. K.P. Sharma Oli will have to try and stitch a situation by which he can sell himself to the population. He is not popular, I think we should be clear. And uh, to say, but he's done nothing for the Terai, and he had no intention to do so. This is simply politics of the people who are involved there, the MPs who are there, the people have nothing to do with all of this. Now, in this situation, trying to win votes, let's remember he came to power strongly on a bandwagon of protesting against India, but there was another element. He stitched together this coalition with Prachand and brought him in. This gave him this very comfortable near two thirds majority. Now, Prachand is out. 
in a sense it would seem to many that prachand is over the maoist revolution etc all that seems to be coming to an end he barely survived last time by joining hands with mr holi did well got roughly 50 mps but his state of play today is such that where is he is nowhere really in the equations the alternate that was being looked at was sher bahadur dioba the former prime minister and the leader of the nepali congress so this is the state of play in nepal mr oli will play his shenanigans in my understanding the area in which he would work hardest is within his own party more so than prachand etc only speaking i don't think he sees them as real power threats to him within his own party and within the pahari community to try and salvage his reputation and again try and sell himself as some kind of a leader will he be able to sell himself as an uber nationalist i don't know we have to see because everything has its limits and those limits were perhaps crossed last year but we have to see there's no doubt he's a very astute politician he's played his cards very well and well he's remained in power even after losing a no confidence motion absolutely and you know this is another aspect that i want to take forward with you i think uh, prabhat you you mentioned it in your opening remarks as well you know and the ambassador has raised it too because of the kind of equations that presently exist in nepal it would seem that uh, kp sharma only would not like to play the anti india card but uber nationalism is something that the ambassador has raised kp sharma only has done this in the past and he has done done it quite often and has gathered support on the ground in nepal as well is this a game that he might play once again well as i said as the ambassador mentioned uh, takur the samajwadi leader whose faction or chunk of the some i guess it's the same party with a different leader um who he's now dependent on for for his support has been a very strong supporter of, of india i mean to put it put it one way he actually held demonstrations yeah. against the constitutional changes uh which which in which uh, oli and other paharis had pushed and that india had opposed uh he had also if i remember correctly thought that the the battle over the border uh, this border uh dispute uh he had strongly also opposed uh, the the nepalese government's position on that so he's very much a man who's invested uh, as most what they see parties have uh in maintaining a strong relationship with india so it's interesting it's hard to, i don't know but presumably takur and uh only have made come to some understanding uh and it be my guess would be takur would say one of the things you have to drop is this business of of, of attacking india in which case only then has to sit down and find another basis uh for holding both the coalition together and to build up momentum within his own government uh, i would tend to agree that he doesn't believe prachanda has too many choices so prachanda really has no choice but to either just sit there and and be passive uh, or quietly support only and try to see if he can find another means to either topple only but keep it within the keep that same coalition going and deoba continues to miss the opportunities if you wish uh, of coming to power but i think the problem right now um is going to be the covid pandemic it's now spreading rapidly in nepal you'll notice that only before the vote of no con first vote of no confidence he had uh, uh, done a, a editorial or an op-ed piece in the guardian in paper in england asking effectively begging britain for vaccines Uh, and he didn't mention either, either India or China as a source of vaccines in the op-ed. He just said, "You're the head of the G7. We have great historical ties between Nepal and India. Please help me." Um, and that is a clear sign that I think he's getting desperate. He needs; they need vaccines desperately. They got a bunch from us. They're getting some. I believe they got a, at least the first set of shipments from China, um, but he needs a lot more. Um, and nepal i mean our healthcare system is relatively powerless nepal's is much worse shaped than ours is and has no capacity to to handle a major breakout of of the pan, of of covid-19 in the country so he needs and i think many ways my sense my sense is that especially if the pandemic replicates what it has already been doing in nepal i mean in bihar and up south of nepal then this will be the primary policy problem that his government is going to face uh and that he has you know he has barely a couple of months 
India, unfortunately, not able to help him right now or not be able to do so, I think, for at least another month, a uh, month and a half. So China will obviously step in. But he seems to trying, if I, my guess from that op-ed piece to the British, is that he doesn't really want to go down the China path too much. Uh, not only because the Chinese vaccines have shown that they have a certain, their efficacy rates are relatively low, uh, but I don't think he wants to get into a geopolitical struggle, if you wish, uh, on, on vaccines and is looking for a third neutral party to get the vaccines from. But this is going to be, I think, the primary challenges of his government is COVID and how does he play the politics of COVID uh, without getting his country dragged into another struggle, a uh, larger uh, political struggle. Absolutely. Talking about yeah. challenges and talking about policy issues that need to be addressed at the earliest, Professor, uh, what what other issues, what are the challenges do you see for KP Sharma only and how do you see the, him at, you know, at least trying to address them in the near future? Clearly, uh, addressing the pandemic, uh, without doubt, is the topmost challenge because as and when elections happen in Nepal, they would be judging uh, the government in power primarily as to how has it handled the pandemic situation. Uh, so that definitely will be the first priority uh, for uh, Prime Minister Oli. Day-to-day -day priority will also be, of course, to keep his you know, position in power you know, stable as much as possible. And my sense is that uh, we should not completely rule out patching up between Prachanda and Oli once again. Uh, for almost last uh, more than one year, their differences are in public. I mean, they have really spoken about, uh, you know, their differences in uh, press conferences. So, uh, and they have stayed together all this time until, you know, this, uh, uh, the court reinstated the parliament and in February again, Prachanda said he's withdrawing support. Uh, so they might also, you know, find a way of uh, patching up and then it would not need uh, the so-called united uh, Nepalese Communist Party to look outside. Because even if, uh, uh, you know, the Janata Smaj party leaders uh, are all kind of uh, possible allies of uh, Oli and uh, even half of that uh, uh, the, 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 the JSP coming to uh, support Oli could make Oli cross that uh, half mark. Uh, but going back to Prachanda would be far stronger position in that sense. So uh, how to kind of maintain his... Uh, you know, government in, in power and have majority in parliament uh, is something that is going to constantly occupy you know, Oli's uh, 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 mind and his uh, mind of his team in, the, in that sense because these differences are not disappearing very soon except I think the only uh, advantage that Prime Minister Oli would have is that in, in a situation like pandemic most members of parliament would not be interested in, in you know going for another election because it is uncertain as to till when the situation is going to continuously be as, as difficult as it is. And they would like to continue if they can. And in that sense, that empowers uh, Oli to stay in power, uh, whether as caretaker, prime minister, or to come back again uh, and then sort of uh, uh, patch up some kind of coalition government. The constitution also makes him strong in that sense. As long as he's in uh, sitting as, as prime minister of Nepal, uh, it is... Prime Minister of Nepal, who makes uh, all decisions virtually, and on the advice of Prime Minister is how Prime President will be taking decisions. Uh, so in that sense, uh, he has advantage of being in power. He has advantage of numbers. 121 members of parliament are supporting him, uh, which is uh, unusually bigger number than any other uh, factions or, or parties that we are talking of. So at this stage, I think it's clearly advantage only, which makes him also showcase that he's not desperate to sort of uh, seek China's help in that sense because this could have some reaction from India. Uh, and in that sense, he's trying to con constantly balance between sort of uh, external players who might be interested to see what happens to the situation in, in Nepal. So my sense is that, uh, you know, there are no other options other than either going on for next elections or Prime Minister only staying in power because Nepalese Congress had staked the claim uh, uh, but, you know, obviously the factions are so you know, sort of badly and so minuscule divisions in parties that exist that they couldn't really patch up together. And uh, so there's no, no, no kind of scenario of them coming back again, even if uh, Oli was to lose, uh, you know, sort of vote of confidence again in 30 days. So to me, until next elections, Oli is continuing to be in power, which is unusual, despite the fact that the master says he's not popular uh, in, in, inside the Nepal. But he is good at playing that card, both China card and sort of uh, 
jingoism card and he would use that when you know he's pushed to the wall uh, so you know he has i think this uh, unusual uh, kind of uh, you know, aptitude of staying in power or skill of staying in power and i think he is likely to stay in power uh, until we have next election so that's my sense and in that sense if he's making kind of positive soft overtures towards india india better uh, you know, sort of respond to those observe or, or sort of uh, gestures and then sort of and not kind of completely ignored because we have seen that last year the fact that india was not able to sort of uh, respond to the some demands of nepal had really created a, a difficult situation in bilateral relations and so india should not give any reason you know, for prime minister only to sort of uh, push the relationship into a difficult uh, kind of uh, bind uh, and so if he is trying to make some kind of a gesture uh, of not appearing to be pro china which is unusual India, I think, should respond to such uh, such uh, gestures from from so. The sentence that was running in my mind when uh, when the professor was talking about K P Sharma Oli and how he survived is, I'm a survivor, nothing else. I mean, that's what he's been doing. He's been surviving. He's done it all in Nepal. So, time to get closing comments now from all my panelists uh, with the, the best way forward and what all of this means really for India and Nepal. Starting first with the ambassador. Frank, uh, I, the way I look at it is that at the moment, Prime Minister K P Sharma Oli, no matter what happened in the past, and no matter the fact that he's extremely skilled at holding on to power, which is something in Nepal all politicians aspire for. That's the beginning and end of it all. I also want to make a simple point. Of course, COVID, the health side is important, but remember, Nepal is critically dependent upon remittances, and so the Nepalese economy and what COVID is doing to that globally and elsewhere will become the issue but i don't think these are the things that will really concern kp sharma oli although of course deaths etc will it will be to stay on in power he will be able to manage in all probability as caretaker or whatever way and how long it takes for the elections to be done through various stratagems such as emergencies it can't be done today it's covid time etc but hang on pull this thing along but after that survival again means selling himself in the people and really in the pahadi community and you know what jingoism in nepal really means we all know it i think right now many people say that prime minister kp sharma oli in a sense owes his position to uh, i don't know what to say indian support or you know india's uh, friendship or india's willingness to go along yes and so i think in that sense it's a bit of a respite for us but on the other hand Nepal, its politicians, their desire for the chair will continue, and K P Sharma Oli will, of course, symbolize that as he has done very well all throughout. And we can look forward to much of this particular, let me say, comings and goings on the political side in Nepal in the coming months, uh, certainly. Absolutely, Pramit. Yeah, I think one of the things that's important uh, we in India need to keep in mind that I know that we get a little excited about a Nepalese prime minister being quote pro chinese or anti indian uh, but you know this is a this is a coalition of about eight or nine power centers of power uh, in Kathmandu who basically re form coalitions break up coalitions reform they also sort of all take turns in, in in staying in power for a little while here and there or being a member of a ruling coalition so in many ways no no uh, structure there is stable enough or ever strong enough to pose a genuine threat to India. And Nepal's overall economic, uh, its immigration, its military relationship with India is so overwhelming uh, that there's a limit to how far you can play that game. So even with Oli, uh, we, we've already seen that limit being reached in my, in my view. Um, and while he's not above playing that card again, he will only do so if certain circumstances arise. So we're 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 with Oli. We can expect Oli to be around for a while. He's proven to be remarkably more adept, I would argue, than many of the other players in the Nepalese game, right? Political game right now. Um, but uh, there's nothing to be really concerned about it. However, COVID in Nepal is a problem, not just for Nepal, but it is also a problem for India. Nearly half of Nepal's population lives in India. Uh, the border is completely open. Uh, so if we are, even if we are able to eventually control uh, the second wave, as we call it here, uh, if we 
can't help or if Nepal cannot uh, resolve its COVID problems, then in, eventually we will be affected by what happens in Nepal. Absolutely. And Professor, close the show for us with your concluding remarks. The current uh, political uh, drama in uh, Kathmandu has uh, so far moved in a direction uh, reinforcing and strengthening the Prime Minister Oli's hands in that sense. The fact that opposition could not club together uh, any any kind of government uh, when the opportunity came, and uh, we have now the uh, Prime Minister Oli being sworn in uh, for third time, uh, means that he has now advantages over his other competitors. Uh, the fact is very clear that uh, main opposition party, at least Congress, is not likely to provide him support. Uh, Prachanda is uh, relatively less likely as well, and therefore his possible uh, approaching uh, uh, the JSP, perhaps, which is clearly understood to be friendly to India, uh, could in that sense see certain uh, greater balancing uh, in Prime Minister Oli's uh, engagement with both India and China. Uh, but the fact is that uh, he's uh, the longest serving prime minister under this new constitution and is likely to continue to be the kind of uh, main player in Nepal's politics uh, for a long time to come. Either he's able to bring again some kind of a coalition or as caretaker prime minister. Yeah, so I think he's going to be a really influential politician in, in Nepal and India must keep that in mind. All right, gentlemen, we'll have to leave to that. Thank you so much for joining me on the program and putting things into perspective for us. What's coming out of this discussion is that KP Sharma Oli is a wily old customer and despite losing a trust vote only a few days ago, managed to cobble up the numbers. This shows his tenacity. His coalition with the Terai parties means he may not play the anti-India card, but anything is possible with him because he has shown his uber nationalist self in the past. The biggest challenge for the new Prime Minister will be dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic that has hit Nepal really hard. He will also have to look out for his political future, which will be playing on his mind. Once again, thank you for your continued support. For those of you who haven't already subscribed, please like the video, subscribe, hit the bell icon and then all notifications. Do follow our social media handles for all the latest updates and you can also subscribe to our newsletter to get some incisive content. The Bharata First team runs a daily big picture quiz. Please do participate by going through the description in the big picture videos. Here are the UPI IDs for those of you who would like to come forward and contribute. A small contribution you make will be a giant leap for us to keep bringing you this content. So do continue to show your love and support. All this information is in the description of the video. So kindly go through it. With that, it's a wrap. See you again next time. Thank you.